Isaiah 55, verses 8 and 9. And do not think that we are out of the life of Joseph yet, because we're at Isaiah. Yeah, we're still there. Isaiah 55, verses 8 and 9. When you get there, if you're able, let's stand. If you don't have your Bible, it's right up here on the screen in big, bold print. And uh, let's read these two verses together, okay? For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Some very interesting words and definitely some good words for when life is kind of confusing and you don't really understand what in the world is going on. Uh, it's just good to know that God knows and that he has a better plan, a higher plan, and a more important one than you do. And so sometimes life, as it doesn't pan out the way we are wishing or hoping, uh, always know and rest that on the fact that God has your best interests in mind every single time. Let's bow our heads and pray. Father, we love you today and thank you for the opportunity to be in church this morning. And we ask that you'll guide and direct our thoughts as we center them around your word. In Jesus' name, amen. You could be seated. So uh, today's a very weird day because I forgot my Bible. <laughs> and I'm the pastor. So hopefully everything's up here. And uh, this could be the shortest sermon, the longest sermon, the craziest sermon. We just don't know where this thing's going to go. So I didn't forget it. I just, uh, I, I don't need it. I got it all right up here. So I'm going to roll with the punches. I just thought I'd be upfront and honest with you guys. The pastor forgot his Bible. So you got something on me, all right? So my guilty conscience is getting me. All right. So we're going to talk about how to handle the ups and downs of life. Because no matter where we are in the world and uh, where we come from, where we're headed, there's going to be some ups and downs. And so we're going to have to learn how to deal with those. Okay. And so nobody in the Bible, I believe, portrays this better than Joseph. And so let's think about Joseph. Now, we've got, as a church, Thursday night, Sunday morning, Sunday night, we've been talking about Joseph for about a good month now. Most of, some of you may not realize it. How much we've been talking about it, but he's an amazing individual. I don't know of anybody more amazing than him. And but I want to want you to see a little graph that I had Jesse make last night. I called him at ten thirty our time, which is eleven thirty his time. And I'm like Jesse, how's it going? He's like, what do you want? And I'm like, I need you to make me a graph for church tomorrow. <laughs> he's like, are you serious? I said, yeah, I already did most you some money, man. You got to do this. He's like, okay. So uh, he helped me make this and. Uh, and so I want you to see a little bit of his life. So we all know Joseph. We've been talking about him for a while. So I'm just going to recap <clears throat> some of his life events. So remember the first state of Joseph at 17 years old. He's the beloved of his father. He's got a coat of many colors. He's the youngest of all the children. And, and his brothers are jealous of him because his dad seems to favor him. So he was in a very nice position. He was a shepherd. He did his dad's duty but he was living the life of Riley he was a great person and didn't have much else going on other than just living in Beulah land I guess you could say and everything was great in his life and uh, lo and behold uh, everything goes south really quick and on a whim as his brothers capture him and throw him in a pit and end up selling him into the uh, Midianites who sold him to the Ishmaelites who sold him to Egypt and uh, so he ends up going down and he's, as he's sold into slavery. And, you know, well, this is a bad thing for Joseph. Now he's left for dead or, he, you know, we don't know what he wasn't left for dead, but he was sold into slavery. And his dad thinks he's dead and his brothers know what they did. And, you know, he's a slave, but he ends up in a man's uh, house named Potiphar. Potiphar was a chief and captain of the guard of Pharaoh. So he was a man of means, a very great guy, like. He had servants, he had workers, he had property, he had a lot. And Joseph goes from like being the, the, the lowest guy on the totem pole to being the highest guy in Potiphar's house. So he worked his way up and uh, in Potiphar's house and becomes the head of the house. And he's actually like in a really good place. He went from like make, being a welfare case 
and below that a slave to now being like making good money and being an important person and the bible says that potiphar didn't even think or care to think about anything to do with any of this stuff he put everything in joseph's control and joseph was like a ceo of this this i would say at that time maybe a billionaire uh the equivalent to um well, if we were comparing our age to that age, this guy was number two of the, the guy's right hand man, number one man. All right. Well, then Potiphar's wife ends up getting uh, uh, a little frisky with Joseph. She want, tries to get him to lie with her, and he won't do it. And he ends up fleeing the scene, and she grabs his mantle on his way out. And he's like, "I'm who am I to stand in the place of God and do that to my my master?" Why would I even think of that? And she, he runs out the door and she screams rape and says he tried to rape me. Because he knew he had to be honest after that. He would never be able to be in the same position he was in once before. So now she falsely accuses him of trying to rape her. And now Potiphar is just condemns him and takes him to prison. And now he's back down in the prison again. So he's now in this time, though, he is left for dead. This is a death sentence. You don't do anything to Pharaoh, the captain of Pharaoh's guard, Pharaoh being one of the most important, if not the important man, man in the world at that particular time. And so he's sitting there waiting his death day. It could be a year from now. It could be five years from now. It could be ten years from now. Whenever they decide to have a party and cut a few people's heads off, look up here. You're not supposed to talk. Uh, that's where Joseph was. But the keeper of the prison finds favor in Joseph. Because God never left Joseph. And he finds out that Joseph's a man of means. He has ability. He, has, he can think. He can organize. He can make the prison run well. And so Joseph ends up working himself up all the way up to being the head of the prison. And the prison guard did the same thing Potiphar did. Put everything in Joseph's charge. Isn't that crazy? And so now he's worked his way to the top twice. And he's been handling the affairs there, and you know the story. The butler and the baker have dreams. They go to Joseph. Joseph interprets their dreams. He says, in three days, you're going down, and in three days, uh, you're going up. You're going to get your head chopped off, and you're going to be exalted back to your butlerhood under Pharaoh. And so the butler goes, he said, but just remember me when you get there, because I didn't deserve this, and I don't belong here. And the butler forgot him. So, man, he worked his way up to the head of the prison, but then he's forgotten by the butler and again left for dead. Isn't that horrible? And so, boy, you can see the, the up and the down in, in Joseph's life. And then lastly, Pharaoh, two years later, has a, a couple dreams. One ends up being interpreted seven years of famine, one seven years of plenty. And then the butler remembers. Ah, there was a guy in the joint that I was with that knew how to interpret dreams. And lo and behold, Joseph comes out, interprets Pharaoh's dreams, and works his way back to the top again. You know? So let's go back. He worked at Potiphar's house. He worked at the prison. And he worked in the land of Egypt. And Pharaoh placed Joseph ahead of everybody and everything had them build granaries, separate everything, divide up the money, divide up all the, the corn and the meal, because there was going to be a time of toughness coming on the horizon, and he needed a man that had the wisdom of God to handle that business, and Joseph was the man. And so, up, down, up, down, up, down, and finally he arrives at the top. And from here, Joseph's life just stays up there, and it just kind of hovers the top. And I, want, I wrote down, I was thinking about all the different highlights from here on out uh, that happened to Joseph. And I want you to realize this because had he never mastered all of this right here, none of this would have ever have happened. So he makes it to the top. He's the highest ranking official in the land other than Pharaoh when Pharaoh's in the throne. Only if Pharaoh was in the throne would, would he outrank Joseph. Number two, the second highest highlight in Joseph's life at this particular time, because he never comes down again, is that he reunites and forgives his brothers. You know, he remember the story, they come to him, he weep, ends up weeping and exposing himself to that he's Joseph, blah, 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 saves their life, brings him over. Number two, he sees his unknown brother from Rachel, which was prophesied in his name. The word Joseph, when Rachel named Joseph, the name literally means 
God was going to give another kid again to him. God's going to give her another son. And Joseph uh, ends up knowing that's his name. That's what it interprets. That's what it means. All these years, and he's wondering about his mom. He's wondering about his dad. He's probably wondering about that. His name, because his name means that God was going to give Rachel another child. And when his brothers told him that day that there's another son sitting at the house, I mean, that, that crushed Joseph because that meant it was a son of his mother, Rachel, not just another son of his dad, Jacob. And so it really hit home to Joseph, and Joseph really wanted to see his brother, his brother that he never knew he had, his brother from the same mother, all right? And so uh, David's going out. You got to go. Take your book and go with Jackson. Find it. Go. Shelby, go help him find Jackson. And you stay with them and help. Go. Run. Hurry, hurry, hurry. I'm getting somewhere. I just want you guys to see some of these things. So he reunites from, uh, and or he finds his lost brother that he never knew he had. He reunites with his father. This is an emo a momentous time. You know, you got to think, his dad never knew he was alive. His dad was lied to him. And then when Joseph, finally, and he was his dad's beloved, he, the Bible says that jo Jacob loved Joseph more than all the others. He favored him. And for Jacob to get Joseph back, and Joseph to have that love that he once had with his dad restored again, the Bible says they embrace for a long time. Isn't that something? And it's right there in Genesis uh, 46, 29. I can only imagine the tears, the feeling, embracing all of the things that Jacob and Joseph did that day. That's an amazing story. Number next, another big highlight at the end of the thing. Uh, he adds another tribe with Ephraim and Manasseh. You know, here's Jacob, or Joseph, he comes to see his dad and to get his blessing. And out, the Bible says, out from beneath his knees come these two little rascals, Manasseh and Ephraim. And Jacob's over there, and he's older. He can't see. His eyes are dim. And he says, Who, what are these that are coming to meet me? Who are these little guys? And, uh, and God, and Jacob puts his hand on Ephraim and his hand on Manasseh's head. And he blesses them. And he puts them in the family of Jacob, which was a huge thing. Had that day never happened, 150, 200 years, 215 years from this time, when Israel needed to have an encampment around around the tabernacle, Levi wouldn't have been stuck in the middle serving only the tabernacle. I know that may sound a little confusing to some of you, but if you've been in the Bible a long time, so there's 12 tribes camping around, one in the middle. These two half-tribes are the two sons of Joseph. It's an amazing story. And so number two, or number next, he saves the world from the famine. That's another big highlight of his life. And then lastly, in Genesis 50, verse 24, after Joseph forgives his brother, he's like, hey, listen, God meant it for good. I know you meant what you did for evil. I see the bigger picture here. I forgive you. It's all okay. Uh, God did this to preserve life on the earth and also the promise he goes into the promise that he gave Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And so he preserved the Abrahamic covenant, which was huge. And so sometimes, you know, here's a good idea about life. You know, you just can't give up. You can't throw in the towel. You got to keep on working. One day, maybe at the, towards the end of your life, you're going to see the greatest parts of your life. And uh, you'll see some of the highlights of things, and uh, it's just going to be glory from there. But until then, you know, you got to deal with these ups and downs. I put this one in here because uh, a lot of times people are just never going to see up the ups and downs of life rightly until they turn around. Uh, look at this. Sometimes you have to let life turn you upside down so you can learn to live right side up. You know, when you were a kid and you were hanging on the jungle gym, you know, you are always thinking that, that life is cool upside down, you know. <laughs> but later on in life, you get to thinking, man, a lot of, I, I thought this way. Everybody was going this way. The wide path is, is much more embraced today than the narrow and the straight path, right? And, uh, and you got to make those decisions because to them, it's out, you're upside down and 
they're upside up, right? But to you, they're upside down and you're upside right. Well, who wins? Who knows? You got to start seeing things from God's perspective in order for you to know those things. And so the Bible and biblical teaching teaches us to flip our lives around and start seeing things upside right from God's angle, not upside right from the world's perspective. And so maybe today, if you don't know, you know, if you have a hard time seeing things God's way, the problem may be you just need to get saved. You maybe have never truly received Christ as your personal Savior. If you don't know the Lord, then you're definitely not going to see things his way. Tithing is going to be like a weird thing to you. Going to church is going to be like an odd thing to you. Giving your life and your time and your talents and your money and your, your being and your family to God is going to seem like a very strange and odd thing if you don't know the Lord. So God, when you get saved, he helps you see things. There's some, he puts inside of you what the Bible calls his Holy Spirit. And his spirit comes to live inside of you, and it, it, it helps you to see things God's way. And that spirit kind of agrees with God in some areas and say, yeah, why don't you listen to the pastor today for a change? But, you know, if you're not saved, you'll never see it that way. And you'll butt, butt your head up against the wall and, um, and, uh, and, and not ever see it that way. So if, if your life is upside down, maybe you're not saved or maybe you're out of sync with God. Listen to this. All your ups are downs. And all your downs are are self-rejected because you just can't see them as ups to you they're down so you just reject them and you despise oh no I'm going through a problem right now everybody in life they just hold on and, you know for the, the problems of life life's so unfair I shouldn't be having issues I shouldn't be having health issues I shouldn't be having mental issues or problems on the job or whatever it may be but folks listen to me if you're a christian and and you understand the bible and you understand the ups and downs of life you ought to look at those things and say been here before this ain't nothing but another attack from the devil probably or some other issue or god may be working on me in a certain area and he may need me to, to get something polished up in my life but you know being uh uh, 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 and antagonistic against the downs really doesn't show the wisdom of life. You know, embrace those downs. When I go down and I see things uh, having issues, it always causes me to look inward. It always causes me to reflect. It always causes me to, to think about uh, life from the inside out instead of the outside in. You know, I'm not happy that our church is half full today. I'm not happy that you know, when, when health ain't there or money ain't there. But you know what? Uh, I'm glad life ain't about those things. I'm glad life is about Jesus Christ and that I love him and that I read my Bible and that I care about the plan of God. And I don't care anymore. Once I get to that joyous place where it's just me and him, I'm actually the happiest camper on the planet. And, uh, and all them other mega churches can have their people and have their money. And everybody else that's looking for worldly success can have that. Because if you find a relationship with God, you are the eternal winner. Whether things are up or down, you win. And in every single instance, when Joseph hit the bottom, you'll always find this out. The Bible says the Lord was with him. The Lord was with Joseph. And that is one of the greatest attributes of his life. He never got away from God. That's Christmas. What, what, what do we got going on here? Is somebody get text in church or what? Okay. So, uh, so sometimes we just got to turn our lives around. What did the old preacher say? Uh, he, you know, if you feel like that your fur's being rubbed the wrong way, turn around, right? Turn around. 180 degrees, you know, may help. So number next, I want you to see this one. I think I just don't look at that one. Look at this one. Uh, use the momentum of going down to accelerate your return up. You know what? And you, sometimes, you know, God's not, the, you, God gave you all common sense, right? You can kind of tell when things aren't looking too good. You lost your job last week and you're, all your bills are due and you don't know how many you're going to make. <laughs> you, know, you know, like, 
this ain't looking too good. You can kind of see the sun setting and the horizon, you know, going down. And you know, we all got some common sense. But then in the common sense, you might find uh, uh, on the way down, you might find ways to climb to new heights you never dreamed. You know, I remember I was upset. I lost my job at uh, Pisa Group. I was, uh, I was like one of the number one sellers there. You know, and I, actually, I was the number one seller. I broke all the records, but the, the, I was making more than my managers were making, and and they were mad at me. And uh, because I'm sitting there in four hours, I make what they make in two days. And they asked me if I would be in management. I didn't want it. I don't want that job. I didn't want the headache. I'm making more money now than I would then. So why would I want to do that? But you know, the boss ended up getting it out for me, and uh, ended up having issues and make causing a stink and making something big about it. Uh, making me out to be uh, like a liar and whatever else, or I don't know what she made me out to be. But uh, anyway, it stuck to the owners and the manager or whatever, and, and I got fired. That was pretty humbling. Pretty humbling of an experience for me because I know I didn't do anything. And, uh, <clears throat> and it's kind of hard to, like each sale that you ever get has to be, this was my, my reasoning, each sale I ever have is recorded and it has to be validated in order for me to get paid on it. And the management team is the one that does that. So how can I be doing things wrong all these weeks, months that I've been here and break all these records and have all these plaques on the wall and be cheating and lying and scamming when you guys have been listening to every single phone call and validating those sales because you took the payment for every one of them. How can I be cheating if that's all legit? So Stan, you're not the only one back there, by the way, that has to deal with it. So this was years ago, but you know what? I swallowed my pride. I went out and got a different job. And you know what? Ended up making, I broke all those records, made good money there, but ended up having making five or six times more money than that job ever offered. And I get to spend more time with my wife and kids. So who cares? You know, you, you may be thinking, oh, I gotta hang on to this. It's a job, it's a this, it's a that, it's a person, it's a girl, it's a man, it's a church. Good night. Sometimes when things are slipping away, just let them go. Let them, let them go and you ride this thing out and gain the momentum. Keep your eyes open and God's going to say, see that right there? See that person right there? See that situation right there? Did you hear that right there? Boom! And before long, he points you in a direction. And later on, even though you despise the humility, you, just, you did not like the rejection in life. You did not like the valley. You did not like to go down. You made it to this place in life you weren't really happy about. But then looking back... As you climb that ladder again and you work your way back up to the top, you look back and you're like, man, I'm so glad I went down through that valley because I never would have been up here and found this much better of a job. And that's the way the life uh, journey goes, folks. That's how we travel through life. It's one valley, one peak, one up, one down, and uh, after another. And so use the momentum. You know, every, it's, and you can't use it when all you're thinking about is freaking out over going down again. I'm going down again. I feel the cough coming up. I feel it coming. And, uh, and you know, we freak out. We get on the phone. We tell everybody our problems. And we, we spread discouragement. Let me tell you, folks, listen to me. We've been going down many times before. This ain't the last time we're going to go down. And we're gonna get ourselves right back up and uh, again, and we'll make it back to the top, but even higher the next time. So use the momentum instead of going down. That's all you can do sometimes. Joseph knew he was right. He, knew not, he didn't do it, but nevertheless, he's on his way to prison. <laughs> so there's nothing you can do. And the third thing is Joseph was always busy working. You know what I'm saying? He never gave up. You know, and let me tell you this. We watch this thing called Alone. Um, these guys go out and they, they live in the woods. They're not, not naked thing. Or somebody said something about a naked. I said, well, I've never seen no naked thing. But these people are dressed and they're out there in the woods and they're surviving for the longest. Whoever wins gets 500,000 bucks. And I noticed this, that when life gets really hard uh, for all of them, and, uh, you know, they, they're, it's like they haven't eaten four or five days and finally they caught a big fish and they reel it in, man, and it's a monster of a fish. And they just rejoice and they glory and they thank God and they thank the fish and they thank the earth and they thank everything. And uh, 
And then they go and they eat a meal and they're grateful about the meal. And the very next day, something happens in their life. Maybe it just rains or maybe it's Thanksgiving and they're thinking about being with their wife and their kids. And man, you would think that they have starved another 14 days between yesterday and today. And it's all because they let that next down get them down. And, and you know what some of the good ones do that lasts a long time? They find a project to do every day. So like they'll weave baskets. They can't burn up their calories because that's energy and requires more food consumption. If you ain't got it, you're just going to lose weight. So they'll, they'll, they'll weave baskets. They'll make nets for their fish. They'll build their little chairs to sit on. They'll whittle with their little pocket knives, little Christmas ornaments, hoping to be home by Christmas so they can give it to their boys and their girls and what have you. But they have one project after another. And you know what? Uh, they work and they work and they work. And one thing about work is it balances everything out. Work helps you take your eyes off of the down, take your eyes off of the up, and just focus on work. Because, you know, when you're working, all you can focus on is the task at hand. You're not thinking about, is this taking me up? Is this bringing me down? You're not thinking about that because all of your thinking about for the hours that you're working is working. And you got to make sure I'm, uh, uh, you know, Chris, if you come over and talk to me and, uh, and if I turn my head and swing the hammer, what can happen? Ouch. Quit talking to me. Quit interrupting me. No. So, you know, you, you know you're going to be lured away. So, you know, when you're working, you're going to be focusing on what the heck you're doing. And while you're focusing on swinging the hammer, while you're focusing on cleaning the house, while you're focusing on doing your jobs, while you're focusing on getting a job, while you're focusing on going to church, while you're focusing on working now, while you're focusing on this and focusing on that, one thing you're not focusing on is the fact that you might just be going down in life. <laughs> And, uh, but you can't handle, God controls the roller coaster. You're just in it for the ride. So you just want to, the parts that you may not like the most, you want to try to focus on something else. And one of the benefits is work. Life's, life is ups and downs. So if you look at life here, I found this little image here. That right there is your ups and downs. Okay, so what balances life out? Just work. You know, just work. If you ain't ever focused on anything else, then all you are focused on is, am I up or am I down? Do I need a stimulant or do I need a depressor? Do I need to go do something? Do I need to be somewhere? Do I go buy something? What can make me up? What can make me down? How can I go up or how can I go down? And you start looking at life differently because there's no work on the other side of the spectrum to balance it all out. So we got to have work as a major factor in things because guess what? I really enjoyed seeing this character trait in Joseph's life. Every place when he was out with his dad, he was doing a job for him, finding out about his brothers. He worked as a shepherd little uh, boy for his dad. He was an errand carrier. He was a worker. He was a go-getter for his dad. Then when he was sold into slavery, he was a good slave for uh, Potiphar. Then he worked his way up to the top. And then he was a good CEO for Potiphar. Well, then he got thrown into jail. And then he became a good worker in the prison. And then the keeper of the guard of the prison put Joseph in charge of the prison. Then he was a good CEO, of, a good warden of the prison. And then he's forgotten in the prison, but he stayed faithful and he kept his faith and he kept on working. And later on, Pharaoh needs his dreams interpreted and he interprets Pharaoh's dreams and he works his way up to the top. They make these grain elevators, they make storage places for food because they know on the horizon big things are coming and Pharaoh puts Joseph in charge of everything and he worked. He worked and while he was busy working, everybody in the world would come to Egypt. They had to come through a certain road and at the road, you would think Joseph the guy, the number one guy in the world outside of Pharaoh when Pharaoh's in the throne wouldn't be at the doorstep of the road making sure the business is being done properly, right? Most big CEOs are absentee bosses, right? But not Joseph. Joseph was right there the day his brother showed up and he recognized him. 
he worked as a CEO. He didn't try. He knew that was a mistake that Potiphar made, that Pharaoh made, that that everybody else in this in history made. He knew that was a mistake on their end. He was able to make it to the top and become the ruler of their house because they put him in charge. It was a mistake in one area, but a good choice in another because they didn't have the brains to do it anyway. But the whole point of it was Joseph worked. Everywhere you see him, he's working. And you know, uh, uh, you just got to balance out life's ups and downs with busy activity. You got to be working. You got to have a project. And so, uh, you know, I bought a house as if my life wasn't busy enough that has one project after another for years to come. <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, I like projects. I like it. It keeps me as a man out of trouble. How many guys are out looking at playing video games two, three hours a day, looking at porn, watching movies? I can tell you hundreds and hundreds of pastors are doing the video game thing. The, the Facebook thing. I'm not on Facebook today. I probably this probably some Danny records it. It probably never will be. There'll be being some family file history. Maybe my great great grandkids will want to know what their great great grandpa was all about and watch some old videos. I'm never going to be a famous anything. But let me tell you something. Uh, I'm here today and I'm out of trouble today. And in order to get here today and talk today, I had to be up late last night working on a sermon getting these facts and figures together, working in the Bible, keeping myself out of trouble. Because when you're working, you're balancing out life's ups and downs. So where are you at, where, where are you at money-wise? I don't know, right now I'm busy working on the life of Joseph. Well, where are you at health-wise? I don't really care about that. I'm just got a pillow up behind my back and I'm sitting in a chair. And I'm just watching the, the screen here as I figure out the life of Joseph. Well, what about the job over there and all the people that you got that tore the trailer park? And, and all? I don't know right now. I don't even care about that. I'm just focused on the life of Joseph. And in a little while, I'll be focused on the China buffet, baby. <laughs> gobble, 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 gobble. Amen. And then I'll be zarking out like this. <laughs> and I'll be focusing on my pillow. Only it won't be behind my back, it'll be under my head. So, you gotta work. You gotta work. You can't be a free loafer. You can't just be in for the ride. Sometimes you just gotta, uh, you gotta work your way and balance life out because life is ups and downs. Work balances it all out. Let's go on to the last but not least uh, today. Where are you at today with the ups and downs in your life? Are you working your way to the top? Did you just come off of a big high and you're heading down into another low? Oh, man. You know, those are the funnest times. You will look back in your life. I'm just going to tell you the truth. And you will value the lows more than you will the highs. I'm just telling you the truth. You will look back and you'll be like, man, those were some precious memories, right? Sure didn't want that to happen, but I'm glad it did. And you will value the lows more than you will the highs. And every and but what is the average attitude of everybody about going down? Stop this train! I don't want to go. This is not fair. God is not right. What does hindsight tell you? Precious memories, how they live. That's what hindsight tells you. So what are you so afraid of? God giving you more precious memories? It ain't worth it, folks. Enjoy it all. Enjoy everything. Another thing, no height you ever climb. You'll never you will never be big enough, strong enough, wise enough to handle what's up here if you have not learned what's down here. All the strength you need here was gonna be acquired here. So while you're down there, that's where you need to dig deep. That's where you need to learn to hang on. That's where you need to realize this is where I'm made in the valley. And when I get to the top, I can stay there a little longer because I did my job down there. Another thing, right after every high, just like I said on that movie alone, every time, almost right after every single high is an immediate plunge. 
be ready for it. If your life has been, if you've been living in the Garden of Eden for the past couple months, I don't want to tell you this. I don't want to throw a, a monkey wrench into life for you, but I just want you to use your brain and think about life in your past. You're probably going to have a few more bumps in the road. Because after every high, and you know, uh, they may be in different ways, in different scenarios. Uh, I think Danny's leg was probably the hardest thing as a dad and as a marriage uh, we scratched our heads on. I mean, it was, it was tough. Danny's running around kicking and punching and fighting and hoarding and sorting and doing a whole bunch of other things now. But, you know, that was a pretty big blow, and I just, it was, a, it was pretty tough for us to go through that. You know, probably the hardest thing in our marriage. And, uh, but, you know, uh, life ain't going to be grand. Life ain't going to be just a bed of roses all the time. You're going to get pricked by the thorns, and that's just the nature of the beast. So just be ready at all times, but, you know, but when it does start to happen, see what God, see what God has in it. He says, my ways are not your ways. Neither are my thoughts your thoughts. My ways are higher than yours. They're better. And I think Joseph, he learned throughout the whole ordeal to see things the way God saw them. And he said, what you meant for evil, God meant for good. He saw it all from God's perspective. And that's all that matters. Let's bow our heads and pray. Our Heavenly Father, we love you this morning, thanking you for the Word of God and the life of Joseph. What a great testimony and what a great man to glean some powerful truths from. Help us in our work ethic as we journey through the ups and downs of life. Help us to balance everything out, get our focus on something else other than the up and the down. Lord, as we go down, help us not to fear it like the world, but help us to... Uh, look inward and see what we're made of and see what you have in this certain situation. And Lord, help us to look to you to bring us to another uh, day of happiness and joy. We do pray that uh, you'll accompany us in the journey. I don't know how it would have went if you go through life's ups and downs and you're you never have a God awareness. At every turn, the Bible tells us and assures us that the Lord was with Joseph. And Lord, that's the most important thing for us. From the front of the room to the back today, the most important thing is, is no matter where we are in the spectrum of life, uh, in, in reality, we're all alone. And we're looking. And when we look, we need to find you. We need to know that you're involved in this. And you're a part of life. Not, not a lot. Help us to have that comfort this morning. Be a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. If there's one here that just ain't never seen it right side up because they're upside down, help them to get upside right in Jesus' name.